family. Thanks for joining in with us today. And happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. We hope that you enjoy a really wonderfully special day today. Well, the uncertainties in our world continue, and no doubt you are dealing with your own uncertainties in your personal life as well. But over this next hour or so, we want to ask that you just put those distractions to the side and focus your heart and your mind on Jesus Christ, asking him to meet you in a really special way today as we worship him. All I 
today. Father, fill each home with your Holy Spirit. Fathers, we're not able to meet together in these moments. Father, we rely on you for comfort and strength, Father. We worship you today. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. Father, and we thank you for the cross, Jesus. was broken, your love poured out, you bled and you died for me there on the cross, you breathed your less as you were crucified, you gave it all for me, hallelujah, what a say.
morning, church family. As we continue our time in worship together, uh, this is the time in our service where we get to enjoy watching some pictures, seeing some pictures and some video of those of you who've been able to send something in. I don't know about you, but this is about my favorite part of each service. I love getting to see your smiling faces and your families or uh, just you and your wife or you and your husband um, or you as an individual. I look forward to this very much. So thank you if you've already sent in pictures or video. If you've not, would you please consider doing that? You can just send that to office at impactcc.net. Uh, but literally just take a picture or if you want a short video of you and what you're doing there in your home, maybe watching the service together, taking communion together, um, uh, whatever it is that you're doing. But uh, I don't know about it, everybody else, but I love this part of things because I miss you and I enjoy seeing you and um, celebrating just the life and the joy that I see in your faces. After we do that together, we're going to be blessed with a guest speaker today. I've been fighting a, an illness for a couple of weeks now. Maybe it was COVID-19. We're not real sure. But uh, either way, it was about as sick as I've ever been. But I'm doing way, way better every day, noticeably better every single day. I wasn't quite up to being able to preach again yet this week. I will be next week. So in the, in the absence of that ability, my brother Barry, who some of you know, some of you don't, said, hey, Scott, I, I'm not preaching. I have a week off. And if you'd like, I'd love to uh, kind of do a tag team with you and, and be a pinch hitter for you. And I said, oh, Barry, God bless you. That's awesome. Barry's one of my very, very best friends as well as my brother. And uh, we stay in touch all the time. And I was telling him that I preached about Psalm 23 just a couple of weeks ago. And he said, oh, well, I did too. And so we compared notes and he had a little bit of a different take or different perspective on some thoughts. And he said, if you're okay with it, Scott, I'll just kind of share with that because it's an awesome passage of God's word. And I just want to share a little different perspective. And I said, that sounds perfect. So that's what you're going to get to hear in just a moment. For those of you who don't know Barry, he was our lead pastor here at Impact Christian Church for 15 years. He and I overlapped for the last five of his 15 years. And then seven years ago, he accepted God's call to move to uh, Manhattan, Kansas, where he and I kind of grew up. We both went to Bible college there. And, and he's leading a church there, doing a great job. He and his family love Manhattan. They miss Colorado, but they love Manhattan, and it's a great fit. God is working through him in a powerful way. And um, anyway, uh, you get to hear Barry in just a moment. He loves the Lord with all his heart. His passion and his energy and his sincerity just oozes out of him whenever he preaches. So you're in for a real treat. Let's enjoy these pictures these videos, and then uh, we'll worship together by listening to God's Word through my brother Barry, who I love and am so proud of. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the pulpit, if you will, next Sunday. Hey, Woodland Park, it is such an honor to be able to share with you this morning. You know, some of the best memories for my family and for me personally, well, it, it's all around 
that church family right there in Woodland Park. See, you guys loved our family as our kids grew and as our family grew, the church was there to support and to love and to do so much. And I wanna say thank you. From our family to yours, we love you. We're so proud of what's going on there in Woodland Park, how you're continuing to reach those who are lost or hurting or those who are struggling right there in Colorado. And I, I just want to say, keep up the good work. So when Scott opened up this opportunity to say, hey, would just go ahead and share with the church, I was honored to be able to share with you today. And I, in fact, was excited about it and am excited about it. See, my heart continues to be with you guys. You'll always be family to me. I, and I know that Scott just recently shared from the 23rd Psalm, and I just decided to focus on one verse, verse four, as I thought about what would it be that God would have me share with you today. Let me read verse four of the 23rd Psalm. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You know, in the Bible, the term valley refers to all kinds of rough times. You know, Joshua talks about the valley of calamity. Psalm 84 talks about the valley of weeping. Hosea talks about the valley of trouble. In this verse here in the original language of Hebrew, it literally would be translated the valley of deep darkness. You know, whenever I, I look at something from the Old Testament, it's so important to balance it with the New Testament as to how do I interpret this as a New Testament believer and and, and when we deal with hard times, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm a lot like you. I just want to say, hey, you know, if you're going to follow God, I, I just need to have enough faith. I just need to press into him and, and everything's going to be good. So what does our Savior say about rough times? I mean, should we expect it or not? Well, in John chapter 16, verse 33, here are the words of Jesus, our Savior. He says, I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So when I, when I look at the subject of difficulty or valley in life, it's so important to have a biblical worldview, a biblical picture a lens in which to interpret it. See, the Bible makes it very clear that valleys are inevitable. You're either coming out of a valley, you're presently in a valley, or you're headed to the next valley. I, I know you live in a beautiful location. I mean, Pikes Peak is right there just exploding in front of you all the time. I mean, over 300 days of sunshine that you can just look at it and go, wow, we literally live in the city above the clouds. Well, if there wasn't a valley next to Pikes Peak, it'd just be the plains. It'd just become a desert. It wouldn't be a mountain. See, what makes a mountain glorious is the valley that's next to it. You know, that's a part of life that sometimes we forget. And Jesus was realistic about this. He's like, in this world, you're gonna have difficulty, you're gonna have discouragement, you're gonna have suffering, sorrow, sickness, you're gonna have fatigue, you're gonna have anxiety. This is part of the world you're gonna be in. He's like, it's normal. So in the worst of times, it's vital that you remember that. <sighs> have you ever noticed how a good day can become a bad day just instantly? Hey, it, it can just, you look at the news and find out something happening like this pandemic. You can go to the doctor and, and get a test result back and go, oh, hey, it could just be a phone call from a friend and it could be a freak accident. This world is, well, it's unstable because it's not meant to last forever. Could I remind you 
that no one is immune, no one is insulated, no one goes without problems or sorrow or pain or hurt. You know, we do not get to skate through life problem free. Everyone has hurts and happiness. It's a part of life. You know, our Savior also stated in Matthew chapter 5, for God gives his sunlight to both the evil and the, the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. So when you're going through a difficult situation, whether whatever valley that might be, whether it's the present one or one yet to come, I know your instinct is going to be like mine to say, why? Why me? Why not maybe switch that to go, why not me? Because it's a part of what the Lord has told me would come. See, we are not in heaven. And I am so thankful because that means the valley is also temporal. Hey, it's temporal. It's inevitable. I can't get around it. I can't go over it. I can't go. All I can do is just say, all right, it's part of this life, but it's temporal. See, David wrote that even when I walk through the darkest valley, do you catch that? Through. He doesn't say, I dead end, I get stuck, I live forever. See, we, we don't stay in the valley. We go through the circumstance. If not careful, though, I, I see it as a place that is almost like a, a dark hole that I'm stuck in. When he says, no, this is like a tunnel and there's a light that's coming. And don't miss that there's a light that is coming. See, life is both wonderful and, and, and yet it's also tough. You know, as Scott and I both said at different times, it's brutal. You know, it's, it's both beautiful and it is brutal all in one. And that's part of this world. And, and it's what allows the, the light of God to shine out of us is when we have hope, even in the darkness, even in the dark valley. So if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your, as your Savior, as your Lord, as your hope, Guess what? He's gone to prepare a place for us because this place is temporal where your body won't hurt anymore, where there is a home that is going to be a mansion. It's described in scripture. I mean, it is going to be perfection and there's not going to be any rotten virus ever again. I look forward to that day. Now, how do I deal with the valley back here? Well, let me tell you also, it's purposeful. I want to make very clear that, that God allows the valleys of life. He doesn't cause them. I, I know that there are times that we try and overanalyze and, and why did God, why did God? Well, God allows choice. Otherwise, we're all robots. And I, I'm just thankful that he's prepared a place that is more than today. And we have a choice of whether to follow him or not. Now, he doesn't cause evil. He doesn't cause hurt. He doesn't cause the heartache, but he does use even the ugliest times for good. The early church planner, the apostle Paul, an incredible story in the Bible, uh, but one of the churches that he planted was in Corinth, and he wrote to this church in his second letter here stating, for our present troubles are small, and they won't last very long. Yes, they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. You know, the struggles of this life are not going to last forever forever. Whether it be financial, relationally, or emotionally, whether it be a health a valley that we're fighting, it's all temporal. I, I know that we love our mountaintops, but faith is built in the valley. Well, when everything is fine, I, I've found that I'm not driven to my knees very often. 
You know, when I'm driven to my knees, when I cry out to God the most, when I lock arms with brothers and sisters in the church, when, when, I, when I grow the most, it's always in a valley. So please, don't, don't get upset about the valley right now. I want to ask you to press into God, press into your church family, press into what he wants to teach and to work into your heart because faith is built in the valleys of life. It's in the valley that we develop character. It's in the valley that we develop comfort. It's in the valley that we find this, this, this absolute presence of the Lord who walks with us. So hold on to that because if not careful, we get excited more about our convenience or our comfort than we ever do our character. And, and that's kind of messed up. That's part of our childish behavior that we got to put behind us and we got to learn to grab hold of what he has put before us. You know, Jesus was not exempt from suffering. And if our, our Lord and Savior went through every unfair and unjust and temptation and stuff that you and I could survive or even think of and that might have crushed us, please know that as a follower of Jesus Christ, we will go through these things as well. Well... Let me remind you, God is good. He doesn't cause evil. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't cause accidents and tragedies, but he'll use them for his glory. In fact, let me go backwards to probably one of the most, one of the best revivals that we experienced in Woodland Park. You go, okay, what was it? What program? What did we do? What happened there? You know what happened? It was actually called 9-11. I remember as that tragic experience happened and as our nation was brought to a standstill, as, as, as hearts were ripped out as we mourned as a nation, you know what happened? The church experienced revival. I remember that time because it's in the darkness that the light shines out. It's in the darkness that, that Satan wants to bring that God says no and his glory is revealed. And so if you're struggling right now, if you're hurting right now, let the light of God shine out of you to those around you. That is the call that he has given us. See, in the valley, oh, let me read this again, what happens it says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they protect and they comfort me. You know, David was saying something there here, that he made a choice not to be afraid. How is that? Well, he had a, an eternal mindset. We are called to think eternally over and over and over throughout the Bible. See, as Christians, our faith is in God, not here on this earth. And if not careful, you're looking to the governor, you're looking to the president, you're looking to, to all the different ones, the scientists, and where are we going to get a vaccine from? What's going to happen with my retirement? What's happening in my bank account? You know, how, how do I get you know, my, my finances stabilized? If I get a stimulus, what am I going to do? Stop. Take a deep breath. This is not your home. This is not your foundation. I want to challenge you to remember where your home is and turn your eyes back to Jesus Christ. See, he's gone to prepare a place for us, and I must remember that I'm walking through this world. He, See, David didn't say, I'm running through the valley. He didn't say, I crumble in the valley. He didn't say, I roll up in a ball in the valley. He didn't flee in the valley. He walked through it. And there's an implication here that he's choosing not to be afraid. He's choosing to put his faith in something that matters. Rather than focusing on the problem, he's focusing on the power of God. You know, there is a way in which I can set my mind on my Lord, my God, my Savior. And it's something that, that we don't talk much about, especially in the United States. It's called meditation. Ah, like anything that you talk about, I mean, worship or, or, or you know, giving I and mean, serving others or meditation can be used for good and it can be used for bad. Even the gift of intimacy that God gives a husband and a wife to celebrate their marriage in can also be something that's ugly if if misused. And so while you might think of meditation and go, wait a second, don't, 
Hey, well, I'm not sure we're supposed to do that. No, the Bible actually talks about meditating on the truth, meditating on what is good, meditating on the word of God over and over and over. So don't throw out something that God has said we are to do. It's basically just this, where I focus on the truth of God rather than on the mess of man. On, and rather than the hurt or the pain or the, the, the struggle around me, I just come back to the simple phrase of, man, Maybe it's just something as simple as I learned and you learned as a little kid. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, I, that there's something greater, that there's a home that's coming where, where there's not gonna be any sickness or death. You know, as I focus on that, as I meditate on it, the things of this world start to fall away. I know that you know that, that you can push through a lot of stuff. I know that you can just say, you know what? I'm just gonna buckle down, I'm gonna get through this. And human willpower can take you a little ways, but it's only God's power that can take you all the way. Please trust in a source bigger than yourself. Think eternal and remember that God is close. You know, as a, as a little boy, I, I, when I would be scared of the dark, when something would go wrong, it was amazing how dad's presence or mom's presence or my big brother Scott's presence, my, my big sister, who's now really little compared to me, would, would just calm everything. I'm like, wow, they're there with me. And I'm like, okay, the boogeyman can't get me. As a little boy, I would, I would just immediately sense all the fear go away when they were with me. Something happens here in verse four that you might not have noticed. Uh, you know the first three verses, there's a strategic change that happens at verse four. See, David was talking about God for the first three verses. He's like, he leads me beside still waters. He guides me in green pastures. He restores my soul. But when he gets to the valley, when, when he gets to the point of fear, when the darkness closes in, he's not content to talk about God. He starts talking to God. And he switches it to, to actually speaking to him rather than about. He's like, you are close beside me. Your rod, your staff, they protect and they comfort me. So in the valleys of life, when we hit those times, it's when we must turn our face to God. When we come face to face with fear, hey, my father is what pushes that fear away. So rather than talking about God right now, I want to challenge you to start talking to God more now than any other time. And then you can learn to lean into his strength. There are times when your strength will just grow weary, you'll grow tired, but when you lean into his Holy Spirit, when you lean into his presence, it changes everything. David reminds himself where his strength comes from. That is from God's staff, from God's rod, that it comfort him. Now, a rod and a staff were two basic tools for a shepherd. A, a rod was basically two foot long. It was heavy on one end, and a shepherd could hurl that, I mean, just like I mean, with a, a weapon that would just shoot out, and they would throw it at anything that would atta attack the sheep. And so he's like, my God is my protector, first there and then you have as well not only this missile that he can basically throw we have the staff oh you know what the staff was used for by a shepherd he would he would pull the sheep to himself he would lift the sheep up out of something that have hurt or pain he would draw them closer and and he's like, my God draws me close during the hurt during the fearful times he pulls us in and that's what God wants to do for you. Now, there are scary parts of life when you face a shadow. Because when you look into the shadow, it's the darkness, it's the, the fear of the unknown that, that begins to just, you just can be overwhelming. Well, what do we know even when we look in the darkest of shadows? It's that God is very much with you that God is very much with me, that God is alive and active at Impact Christian Church, that God is alive and active in Woodland Park, and he's reaching those who are lost. He's reaching out, and I wanna ask you to be the hands and feet of this God into a community that needs this now more than ever. So when you're afraid, 
Don't give in to that fear. Don't give in to the panic of this going around our world right now. You, you turn back to a God who loves you and cares about you. You lean into his strength. You keep an eternal mindset. And then he says, the, the light of this world changes because it comes from on high. I'd like to just stop for a moment here and I'm gonna be back in just a bit. I'd like to ask him to come on the line here and just to be able to sing a beautiful old song called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I hope that as she sings it, you'll listen the first time and then the second time, whether you're sitting on your couch, whether you're standing up, that, that you'll just sing that with her and that you'll allow your heart to be drawn to your Savior. was beautiful. I mean, that was a song I, I sang as a child, and, and I want to challenge you to look full in his glory and grace, to allow your heart to be drawn to the eternal God who loves you and cares about you. The, the hope that is found there is beyond anything of this world. See, Christians will have disappointment. Christians do get sick they go through tragedies. Christians lose loved ones. Christians lose their jobs. But here's the difference. It's who is with you. In the midst of the valley, your God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. In the midst of the valley, your Savior is drawing close. It's in the midst of a valley that the world around goes, there's something different about them. Let them see the light of God shining out as you continue to impact that community because now more than ever, Woodland Park needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to see someone who is leaning into the Lord Savior. They need to hear about the incredible gift of a God who loved them so much that they sent their, that God sent his son to die on a cross that they could have life. You are his chosen instrument right there. Please be faithful, press into that, and let the difference of Christ's presence change how you face this difficulty, because Woodland Park still needs a God who loves them. Let them, be, let them find hope today, through this week, and in the months to come, uh, shadows are gonna happen in life. But here's the thing, the light of Christ is what I'm holding on to. The light of Christ changes how you face the shadow. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so very much for this church family that has blessed me, blessed my family that cared for us as a young getting started minister in her life and our kids being born. And God, I'm so thankful for the countless lives that have been changed through this church body. God, I ask in Jesus' name that you would anoint Scott and the elders and the staff and the leaders and each individual setting out there in, the, in their living rooms right now, separated by distance, 
but united by your Holy Spirit, that you would lift them up, that you would speak to them and remind them that, that they are not alone and that you are not done with them. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that the church absolutely grow through this and comes back stronger than it's ever been. Lord, in Jesus' name, push back the darkness, push back the liar, push back the evil one and have your way. Oh God, would you turn around the lost? Would you help them to find hope through each person as you send them around this community? May the world May the world see by the by your church how we respond that you are alive and active. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. I know that this day conjures up different feelings for all of us. For some of us, we are full of gratitude and joy as we celebrate our moms, all that they've done in our lives and all that they continue to do. For some of us, it brings about loneliness and sadness as some of our moms have passed on. And although they're resting in the arms of Jesus, we miss them dearly, especially on today. And unfortunately for some of us, this day brings about bitterness and anger as it reminds us of the abuse, the neglect, or the abandonment that we suffered at the hands of our moms. But as Christians, as the church, I believe we're called to celebrate this day a little bit differently. You see, for centuries, we have lived by standards that go beyond the culture that surrounds us. You see, our society today has different standards um, that dictate who a mom is, who doesn't have a mom, how to celebrate a mom. But what I want us to look at today as we find our seats at the Lord's table is Jesus on the cross in John chapter 19. See, it was on the cross that Jesus prepared this meal of communion. And what I want us to look at is the very last thing that he did on the cross. We, we find it in John chapter 19, verse 25, and this is after we find Roman soldiers casting lots to divide and separate Jesus' garments. And this is what we see starting in verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son, then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You see, Jesus wasn't content with the work on the cross being completed until he established a family for his mom and his disciple. Until he told his mom, here is your son, and he told the disciple, here is your mother. In other words, Jesus wasn't content with the work on the cross being finished until he established a new family. And I don't believe that this family was just for John or just for Mary. I believe Jesus was establishing the new family for his church, for his bride, for us. You see, our family as Christians, as Jesus' bride, is full of women of faith. And so regardless where we find ourselves today, missing our mom, angry at our mom, loving our mom, the truth is we are surrounded by spiritual moms. We are surrounded by women of faith that we desperately need and that are willing to be there for us. You see, when I was going through uh, the darkest times of my life, strung out on drugs, as far away from Jesus and the church as maybe anyone could be, my mom was praying for me continually, but she couldn't do it by herself. 
Um, I'm sure at times I pushed her patience and tested her to the point to where she might have uh, cursed me instead of prayed for me. Um, but she never stopped praying for me. But you see, her prayers weren't enough in and of themselves. So what she did is she recruited my grandmothers, she recruited my aunts, she recruited her best friends, her co-workers, and the women that are in her and my dad's life group. She recruited the women of faith around her to pray for me. And it took every last one of those prayers for me to encounter the love of Jesus. And it's because of this meal of communion that Jesus prepared on the cross that I have access to the power of those prayers and that I have access to the family that is full of women of faith. And so regardless of where we find ourselves, we are surrounded by a family that is full of women of faith. And today as Christians, as the church, as the bride of Jesus. Let's celebrate those women because they are worthy to be celebrated. And we see Jesus on the cross making sure that his mom was taken care of. So let's take care of those women of faith. Let's celebrate them and let's thank them. Because I know that if it wasn't for the women of faith in my life, and my mom's life at the time, I wouldn't be here today. And so, as we take the bread of life and break it, and as we raise the cup of salvation, we do so as a family. A family that is desperately in need of, and a family that is saturated with women. You guys, this is just another time for me to say thank you, for Impact staff to say thank you, for the families that Impact has been able to help to say thank you. Your giving to continue through this time, through this pandemic, through this uncertainty is amazing. What you guys have done, um, the words thank you just can't do it justice. But unfortunately, that's all we have right now is thank you. And so on behalf of the staff and all the families you have blessed here at Impact, uh, we want to say thank you. Um, we have been able to support our missionaries to still be able to support Hope Coffee. And um, Hope Coffee was just able to give 50 families in Honduras groceries that aren't allowed to leave their house because of this pandemic. Honduras is even more strict than what we are here. And so because Hope Coffee was able to give 50 families groceries, being part of that, you guys gave 50 families groceries in Honduras. So we say, we say thank you for your continued giving. We just want to remind you that you can give online at our website, impactcc.net, or you can text the number that you see there on the screen. Um, and you can always drop a check by the office. We are still here Monday through Thursday, nine to four, and we love seeing you guys. Um, and so any way that you feel led to give, uh, we just want to say thank you. Now, as we wrap up our service this week, I want to remind you guys that today is Mother's Day. And so for all of you that maybe have dropped the ball and not gotten anything for the women of faith in your life, swing by the church because we might 
we have a few of these packets left. I say might because by the time you watch this, whenever it is, they might be gone. But these are gifts for the women of faith in your life in all of our lives. It's just a way to celebrate. There's some um, seeds to plant flowers. It's nothing nothing over the top, but it's just a way that we want to honor the women of faith. So swing by the church and grab it there in totes out front um, and, and celebrate those women in your life today. And so as we end our time together, this blessing is for you, women of faith. May you know that you are loved. May you know that you are valued and you are seen. The days where you feel alone and unappreciated, Jesus is there with you. May you know that the rest of us appreciate what you have done. And may you know that you save lives with your prayers. May you dwell in the house of your Lord forever. May he bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, and may he give you grace. Women of faith, may you know that you are world changers. In Jesus' name. So good worshiping with you guys this morning, and we can't wait to see you again. Have a great day. Lord bless you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.